So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to now introduce our, our first panel. Um, we'll have uh, um, two, two guests in this, this one like last time. Uh, first we have Anna Ricklin, who's the manager of Planning and Community Health Center uh, from the American Planning Association. And then we'll hear from Sam uh, Zimbabwe, Associate Director for, of Policy Planning and Sustainability Administration, uh, District uh, Department of Transportation. And Anna's going to go first. Anna, welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to thank Greg and Martha for queuing up my presentation so well. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk about public health and urban planning and planning and land use. So my themes this morning are talking about reuniting planning and public health for the 21st century, uh, thinking about policy, process, and people, so really building upon what we just learned about, um, and supporting local change because change is happening at the local level and it really can't happen anywhere else. So uh, to take a little walk back in history, this is our founders of landscape architecture and planning, Frederick Law Olmsted, who you might be familiar with for designing great urban parks across the country, and Jane Addams, who you are familiar with as being the uh, founder and grandmother of social work and social justice and a uh, great contributor to public health. And the reason I put both of these folks on the screen is they lived around the same time in the late 19th century and uh, advanced work that had combined goals. They wanted to have fresh air and address crowding, uh, overcrowding in cities and um, really helping people live a higher quality of life. Uh, and as the founders of those two fields, they had similar goals. But we saw that uh, over the course of the 20th century, those uh, goals and those fields split apart and so they became less targeted to people and more, um, more specific and siloed in their efforts. So the American Planning Association is a national association um, with about 40,000 members um, across the United States and uh, we're based here in Washington, D.C. Our members are mostly planners um, and at APA we developed a uh, series of centers looking at specific issues. Uh, so the Green Community Center, the Hazards Planning Center, and the Planning and Community Health Center, which I oversee. And the reason I put these on the screen is just to get a sense of what our organization does uh, and also how we have some really significant cross-cutting issues across these centers. One of them is equity. We focus on these five strategic points of intervention for planning. So I don't know how many folks in the room are familiar with the stages and the areas and ways that planning can actually intervene in your life, whether it be how zoning is lived out or how the comprehensive long-term plan for your whole community is put together. But the first stage of planning is visioning and goal setting. Then there's plan making. Those are comprehensive plans, long-term plans, as well as area plans or functional plans. So a functional plan would look at a system, a transportation system, the network of streets and roads and highways and how transit fits in. Also looking at park systems and open space systems. And then coming to implementation. How are those plans implemented? We look at um, regulations and public investments and private development and how those all fit together to create the built environment. So at the Planning and Community Health Center, we're looking at three main issues currently, active living, healthy eating, and health in all planning policies, which speaks to what of our previous speakers were talking about is really looking upstream and how we can include health at the very beginning of the planning process. We've done some research on comprehensive plans to figure out how often and in which components and chapters of the comprehensive plans that people actually include health goals and objectives. We did a national survey, um, then read plans and did a really deep evaluation, and then did some case study work. Developing these six different domains of how health can uh, fit into a comprehensive plan in different areas in the built environment that could be affecting health. So not just looking at active living and food and nutrition, but also emergency preparedness, environmental exposures, health and human services, and where can a comprehensive plan begin to address social cohesion and mental health. 
We also looked at some broad issues, like is planning accessible to a regular person? If they were to pick up this comprehensive plan for their community, can they read it? Do they understand the language? It's an example from some of our case study work in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They had a really fabulous plan that wended health throughout many different chapters. Um, and they really use the language of quality of life in multiple components of their plan. So for every element of the plan, they looked at the environmental benefits, quality of life benefits, and also the economic benefits that could benefit their community. And they also used the planning process as a way to collect data and as a way to engage other stakeholders. So as we're thinking about how to actually implement the plan, we need to think about where funding comes from. They tapped into local resources with local foundations to implement components of the plan, building upon the foundation's mission. So the question is, who am I talking to in these communities? I'm not clear on that question. <laughs> So planning is communicating with um, both, with all levels of the community. So there's out community outreach that takes place. There's um, partnership building that takes place with different stakeholders. So the business sector, universities, whoever's in your community. Um, and then the work, the plan making would kind of take place you know, in-house in the planning department. In most cities have planning departments, um, but it's, it's a collaborative process, and it is, as a previous speaker said, an iterative process. So actually, here's a picture of the process, <laughs> our ideal process for um, how to integrate health into the, at least at the comprehensive planning level, um, where does health fit in? And it really starts with the mission and vision. If health is a value for the, the planning for the future of the community. What do, what do we want to see in our future? We, will, we want to see a healthy community, a healthy uh, citizenry. And then um, organizing for change, putting those, putting those health goals, splitting them apart. How do, how do we operationalize them into different components of the plan? Uh, and, then, and then developing ways to actually implement them. And then of course, in a feedback loop, doing evaluation and monitoring. And here's an example of how we have started to implement the outcomes from the uh, plan themselves, plan, the ideal planning process through uh, short little tools that we can give to our members to integrate into different aspects of their planning work, whether they're working at the comprehensive planning level or again, looking at area or functional plans. Uh, Safe Routes to Parks is a concept that uh, is built upon Safe Routes to Schools, which many people are already familiar with. But as we think about having advancing access to physical activity opportunities, having Safe Routes to Parks is also really important. And I know the IOM did some research on health impact assessment a few years ago. We're also doing some research on health impact assessment and found that about a third of HIAs done over the past 10 years were in the planning sector, had some relationship to planning. Over two close to two thirds of those were on plans themselves. Um, about a quarter were on policies that were coming out of planning departments or for in the planning field. And then also uh, about just over 10% were on projects. The ma vast majority of those had to do with land use. How was land being used in that community? This is mostly for the record. I don't need to read through all these definitions, but here's a set of definitions on how we think about planning, what plans are, what policies are, as they relate to planning, and what a project is. And most of the key takeaways from that work are really identifying how the HIA process and the planning process are very closely aligned. We share core values of community engagement um, and data-informed decision-making. So we integrate a lot of land use data into planning, and I think we could do a better job to integrate health data into the planning process. And HIA catalyzes cross-sector collaboration, which is one of the core tenets of planning, uh, which again, I think we are moving more in the direction of having a more robust process for cross-sector collaboration. And we also found that health impact assessment is evolving. So it's evolving more to informing a health and all policies approach to planning. 
Another effort uh, across the organization um, at the American Planning Association is developing a new set of standards for comprehensive planning. And you might be wondering why we're focusing so much on comprehensive planning, and it's because it sets the long-term vision for a community, and everything else flows from the comprehensive plan. So generally, a comprehensive plan is a 30-year view of where we want to go in a community. It doesn't mean that it's only done once every 30 years, but uh, it's a long-term view. And those other kinds of plans really flow from the comprehensive plan, and the zoning regulations and other development regulations flow from the comprehensive plan policies and objectives as well. So putting forth a new standard for comprehensive planning can actually have a very significant impact on how communities are shaped into the future. So the standards are called Sustaining Places, and there's these six principles that make up the Sustaining Places Comprehensive Plan guidelines. And you'll see that they sort of build on one another. So we start with the foundation of a livable built environment that's in harmony with nature, that has a resilient economy, and then we think about equity as it weaves across all of the different components of our community, and we think about what the outcome is, which is a healthy community and responsibly connected to all of the areas around it. So the principle five, healthy community, is illustrated here. We want to ensure that public health is basically integrated throughout all components of planning, uh, thinking about eating, thinking about physical activity, thinking about health care and environmental justice. And here's a breakdown of, of different uh, objectives and how they can fit in. So the point of the standards is that planners around the country can take these elements and integrate them into their plans in a more cohesive way, which of course over time will allow for more connected evaluation and outcomes of the impact of the comprehensive plans as well. But now I want to talk about some really specific examples of what APA is doing in local communities to impact health. So APA was the recipient of a really fabulous uh, grant opportunity from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which began in the fall of 2014. Um, and it was a significant amount of funding that allowed us to subgrant out four and a half million dollars to 35 local coalitions around the country who we're working with in collaboration with five national organizations as well. Uh, as our project partner, the American Public Health Association. And because of our goal to change the culture of planning to integrate public health from the very beginning, we wanted to model that at the national level through our own partnership with the APHA organization so that we had a connection with members at the ground level. Our goals, our vision for the project is to promote health equity, reduce disparities in implementation and outcomes, and fully integrate planning to benefit people where they live, work, and play. So Plan for Health is what we've named our project, uh, and we're increasing collaboration, we're increasing community capacity, and we're increasing messaging because it's really important to tell the story along with doing the work. And our values are to leverage cross-sector collaboration, as well as the member expertise of our organization. I believe that we were selected because our members are so far reaching across the country, and we work with members at APHA, so we have a combined membership between the two organizations of about 80,000 people, as well as a broader messaging audience as well. And we're looking at policy systems and environment approaches. That's the core of the work. We're not looking at telling people or educating people on healthy foods or that they should exercise more. The core of the work is to implement uh, policy systems and environment approaches. Our two focus areas are on nutrition and physical activity. And here's a quote from folks in our Boise, Idaho coalition who are saying, talking about how this grant opportunity for them, they're one of our selected communities, has helped them build partnerships that they didn't initially think were important or as possible uh, as they're connecting now. So it's really exciting to see that these relationships, that we're able to support these relationships, uh, as well as give them tools and resources to live them out and achieve their goals. So I mentioned that we have 35 coalitions. They're actually in 27 different states around the country where we're supporting local work currently. Um, and they're actually overlapping in time, so we, they're all active at this time. 
you can see that there are, uh, so the red dots are from the first cohort of coalitions and the blue dots are the second cohort who actually just started their work in February of this year. And here's an example of some of the partners. So all of the organizations that, all of the sites that we funded are working in coalition with a number of different organizations. They have planners on staff, they have public health people on staff, but they also have community um, community organizations, nonprofit groups. Some of them are including clinical care and hospitals. They have transportation. Some of them are including universities and, and professors at universities parks and recreation departments. It's really across the board. It's fantastic to see the variation, but also the inclusion of so many partners. On the left is a list of all of the partners in our Columbus, Ohio coalition. Uh, they've been working together for a while, but you can see that no one is left out. And now I want to talk a little bit about what um, some of our particular communities are doing. So bl splitting them into their topic area of nutrition and physical activity. The top symbol is from our Kane County Coalition in Kane County, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. They're working on a food hub. Their planning cooperative is working on how can they develop a food hub. A uh, food hub is a way of connecting food producers, uh, consumers, and processors so that uh, in, in an integrated food systems approach. So it's really thinking about how they can bring not just fresh foods and healthy foods to their vulnerable populations, but local foods, locally produced foods. So the Plan for Health funding has allowed the Kane County Planning Cooperative to implement a local ordinance. They already had the ordinance to increase access to local food, but they weren't able to actually implement it because implementing ordinances takes resources. And so they are using these resources to do a food feasibility study that's including a market assessment of food producers and buyers for the food hub. They're assisting farmers in changing their operations a little bit to be more oriented towards a local market. And they're testing models for what would be the most efficient way to connect the food hub. They're also looking at some of the logistics of it, like transportation and infrastructure and what are the key levers that are needed uh, for actually making it happen. So it's allowing a little bit of practice and trial and error to get to the right place. On the bottom of the screen is our Kenton County Coalition. That's a, uh, in Kentucky, right outside of Cincinnati. In that location, uh, Plan for Health Resources have made it possible for the Kenton County folks to undertake a countywide assessment of food deserts. And so uh, the dots on the map that you see here are actually the locations of corner stores that are in places that are otherwise uh, seen as a food desert and develop a healthy corner store program in their urban areas in Covington, Kentucky. They're also doing some education about healthy food options, supplementing their built environment policy work with some educational programming, and they're forming a food policy group so that they can continue their work beyond the project period. In the realm of physical activity, we have folks in Nashua, New Hampshire, who are working to implement a complete streets policy. Again, they had the policy, but they hadn't implemented it really beyond their downtown area. So they're using the resources from Plan for Health to implement the complete streets policy, as well as educate policymakers about the importance of targeting funds to complete streets and to pedestrian and bicycle access and safety. Uh, and they've also done some street mapping and really uh, hands-on data analysis to see where the best places are to build new infrastructure. In Columbus, Indiana, so we have our Columbus, Ohio coalition and our Columbus, Indiana coalition. In Columbus, Indiana, the Go Healthy Columbus coalition has um, also working on bicycle and pedestrian safety and they're working in a really place-based way. So they're looking at a specific segment of trail and where that trail crosses some state highways and how they can make the crossing safer. They've engaged the Indiana Department of Transportation in this process and they're testing new ways for street crossings at those places which are busy intersections so that people can bicycle and pedestrian safer. They can therefore feel safer using the trail that exists. And the trail is, they also chose that section of trail because it connects to three community parks. And access to parks is also very important for helping people get outside and get more physical activity. 
So it's really exciting that they're they're taking the opportunity to model those new uh, crossing areas in that segment because with the engagement of the Indiana Department of Transportation, their hope is that they can actually bring that model across the state and not just change those areas in, in, in Columbus, Indiana, but also in other areas in Indiana. And then we also have another grantee in the state um, in Indianapolis who is developing a pedestrian master plan. They've actually just completed the first draft for review, which is very exciting. They've done that in just a little over a year. Uh, and they have, um, they're also promoting walkability as an important component of their city. So not saying it's important to walk, it's good for your health. They're promoting the built environment, the walkability of the built environment as an important value to community members so that community members have more buy-in and support uh, and can activate to their policymakers about the importance of having uh, more walkable streets. And they're also doing a really fabulous public campaign through their Indie Walkways website. Uh, and also, I'd, I'd love to point out to go to the Go Healthy Columbus website as well. It's very exciting, um, kind of a movable infographic that's very engaging, which has also been supported through the funds of Plan for Health. So um, we've seen a lot of great messaging come out of this work, along with a lot of great policies. And just across our different communities, we've uh, seen a number of other points in common. We've seen really systematic approaches. So I mentioned a couple of different communities that are, do, that are doing assessments and audits as part of their work. We've seen also um, not just the development of policies from the ground up, but implementation of policies that are on the books but have not been able to be implemented yet. And we've also seen a supplementation of programming to do some of the awareness raising that's necessary. We can't just change policies or change the built environment and not also increase awareness about the importance of utilizing those, in, those infrastructure changes. And then across Plan for Health, one of our goals is to bring the messages not only to the folks who are engaged in the project directly, but also to our other members. The, projects are being run through our state chapters. So the idea is that even though these projects are local, the messages and the lessons learned can be translated across their state chapter. And we've seen that in um, a number of states already where they've shared their lessons learned at their state conferences. They meet with other members of their organization, uh, even outside of the coalition work. And part of the way that we're doing that is through a peer learning network where we're allowing coalitions or supporting coalitions to connect, um, to share lessons learned and their experiences, as well as with the wider membership, as I mentioned. And then contributing to the movement for multi-sector professionals to connect as well. We want Plan for Health to be bigger than just the project that it is now and to move beyond the project period, which is only a three-year project period, and to really grow the movement for planning and public health so that it's more integrated into the thinking of planners, so that it's more uh, utilized and understood by public health professionals, that they know they can go to planners if they want to have a big, wide structural in intervention that public health people know how to talk the language of planning a little bit better and also to um, obviously impact communities nationwide at the local level. If you go to this website you can see a lot of great videos. And one other piece of the peer learning network is our new research forum. So we are looking at the, all of the practical outcomes of developing new policies and building new bike lanes at the local level, but we're also looking at what some of the research is bringing to the table and how we can learn and translate that research into applied practice. So um, one of our first webinars that we're going to be presenting on the research is from one of our communities in Dane County who's put together an active living index. It brings together public health data with land use data and other built environment data in Dane County, which is where was, uh, Madison, Wisconsin is and allowing it to be kind of a decision-making tool for where should we prioritize our efforts, where should we prioritize our funding and collaborative work in the community looking at uh, geography-based um, information. So moving forward, um, I was asked to talk about what are some of the norm shifts or ways that we can define success 
And so thinking about norms, I think um, we need more models for institutionalizing planning in public health. And we need a broader concept of what cross-sector collaboration means. I mentioned at the beginning the six different domains for looking at the integration of health into comprehensive planning. And we really need to look beyond active living and healthy eating, which I think are super important um, and definitely are the foundation of uh, the connection between planning and public health, but also thinking about the importance of planning and of public health impacts of emergency planning, of climate change efforts that are taking place in planning departments, what, so, what emer environmental and social justice mean, um, as well as what can we do as planners and to think about social cohesion and mental health. And another piece that we need to think about is engaging healthcare. I know that was actually a question in the last panel, was talking about how can we better engage healthcare and hospitals. I think that while uh, it's been sort of a tenet of public health to say public health is more than just health care. That's certainly true, absolutely. But we also need to think about ways that we can leverage hospital investments to benefit wider public health. Maybe it's through their community benefit requirement or other ways that we can think about um, leveraging their vast influence in communities. And when it comes to measurement, I think that we can do better to illustrate very specific links between built environment features and both individual and population health outcomes. There's been a lot of work done in this area, but there's a lot of mediating factors, as were mentioned on the previous slide. And I think that we could uh, do well to develop a list of key place-based health metrics that can be included in plans. So similar to the comprehensive plan standards, that I mentioned earlier, I think that we could benefit from having a very specific list of metrics there. And leadership is very important as well. I think we need to uplift and support local cross-sector leaders and support them in taking risks. And I think we need to advance both formal and informal training across sectors for planning and public health. I think there's a lot of very important learning that happens at the in the classroom. There are more and more people graduating from master's programs with dual degrees in planning and public health, but there's also a bunch of people already working in the field who could benefit from some less formal training and thinking. Of course, the outcome from that would be a robust cross-trained workforce. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>